so you've been talking about how Gwen has been around for going on six years, and you've done all these actions. And what do you? How do you see it as? How do you see? How how are you rating the effectiveness of this, and how do you see it being effective? And what do you see as necessary as you're moving forward to to promote the change that you're 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 working towards? Here? Yeah. Um, so just as you said, making the point, we we've tried most everything that um, a reasonable person could attempt to do. Um, somebody might come up with something that we haven't done, but um, believe me, it's it's um, after five years, if we haven't done it. it we didn't think it was worth doing. We, we, we've tried to focus on the big picture. It's, you know, I guess one benefit of going to Harvard Business School, you, they teach you to think big. So um, it doesn't bother me to say that President Obama should be the focus of these efforts. Um, you know, I have friends and neighbors in town who, with all due respect, um, get fixated on the fact that there's a street light on during the daytime, let's say, near their house. And so they're working to get the DPW to turn it out. And that's good if everybody working at every level is helpful. But to me, when, when I think about everything we've done and everything that could be done and why it isn't happening, I, I do come back to our elected leader. Um, it is President Obama. He won the election fair and square. Um, as I said, I grew up in Ohio, I was a Boy Scout, and I learned to follow the president, and so I'm surprised to see the almost disrespect he gets from others in the political arena about trying to, and I guess it's a stated fact that some members of the GOP have said their objective is just to make sure that Obama doesn't serve a second term. And um, to me, that's un-American. We should be following our leader. And I think because of all the political pressure that Obama is getting from the right, um, it's become difficult for him to address some of the problems that the left um, is concerned about. And, and I consider myself uh, on register, I'm, I'm going to vote for whichever candidate is going to basically help preserve a livable climate for the kids and grandkids. But if you think about it, it, it's hard for Gwen or any group to get the attention of the public. Um, Susan just read an, an interesting article where the, the headline was, we're too busy to save the climate or some such thing. And, and that captures it unfortunately very well. When we were tabling in the supermarket, we'd, we'd ask people, do you have a minute to talk about the climate change issue? And the, the woman would look at us and say, well, not today. And she'd go off to buy more groceries. And we're thinking, well, when would be a good time? Like, and, and <laughs> convincing one person at a time is also going to be a long process. And we don't have a lot of time. That's another thing people don't understand about the climate situation. It, it's not one where we can wait until everybody agrees that it's a serious problem and then we call out the Marines and tackle it and solve it. It's a, a system with tremendous inertia and momentum and um, we're already close to tipping points according to the scientists beyond which we might not be able to put Humpty Dumpty back together again, so to speak, and to prevent a runaway heating planet, which would take us basically over the long term to um, a permanent state of being a planet like Venus that's 800 degrees or so on the surface of the planet. But I don't want to get into too much science. I want to get back to President Obama. If Obama would go on primetime national TV, similar to what he did last night speaking to Congress about jobs, and get Secretary of Energy Chu on one side and his science advisor John Holdren of, of Harvard on the other side and 
the military leaders, retired and otherwise, who have also said that climate change is a very serious problem for the country. And, you know, anybody else he wants, I mean, he's the president, he, he could get uh, a cadre of great people to support him on this speech, and he'd simply take an hour and explain to the American people, you know, look folks, climate change is real, it's serious, it's urgent, and we've got to deal with it. And we're going to do that, and we're going to work together, and we're going to solve this problem, and everything will be fine. And that's all true. We have the money, we have the technology, we just lack the will to do it because most people think everything's fine because climate change isn't that obvious. Um, as I said, it gets back to the disconnect from nature. People that are younger don't know what the climate was like 20 or 30 years ago. Um, the weather people are acting like it's just an exciting time to see these storms coming and you know, seeing a storm coming in is an example of how we can't stop Mother Nature from doing things. We, we report the tracks that are being followed and projected for the hurricanes. We don't go out with the Air Force and stop them. And a hurricane is a small <laughs> little part of the Earth that's presenting a problem. And the hurricanes are stronger because they pick up their energy from uh, going over warm water the oceans are absorbing some of the heat from climate change and so the storms have more strength. So um, why isn't Obama going on national TV to explain this? Uh, the United States, for, from my travels and discussions with people from other parts of the world, is unlike we were after World War II, uh, being the global leader of the free world, we're now the country that's dragging its feet on climate change. And it, it makes me sad and to some degree embarrassed that we're holding the rest of the world back. We should be leading like we did before. So I spent a lot of time thinking about, well, how can this be happening? Um, it's it's mind-boggling. To, to some degree, it's a focus on the short term. Um, and that's what business people do, going back to the business training. Um, business executives are charged with maximizing the profits of the company each year, or from Wall Street's point of view, each quarter. The, the public company's earnings come out, and if the earnings are up, that's good. If the earnings are down, that's bad. So optimizing the short term is the way business works. But as anybody who wants to think about it for a minute, can imagine, just, just to substitute the role of being a parent for being the leader of the free world. If, if you optimize the short term for your kids, um, doing what they wanted that made them happy, probably very few kids would go to school. If they were able, very few kids would get a job. Um, that wouldn't work out very well. So it's sort of uh, an illustration of what it's like if a country optimizes the short term. We, we do need to give jobs to people. I understand that. We do need to keep the economy going. I understand that. But if we're going to be doing that and ignoring a really huge problem that's going to appear on the horizon later, and then the government's going to have to say, gee, we can't do anything because frankly, it should have been done 10 years ago. Well, what are people going to say then? Like, oh gosh, um, they're going to say, why didn't you tell us? If you had explained to us in 2011 that we could work together and, you know, cut spending perhaps on defense, or, or uh, and that would be my prime suggestion because we spend roughly 60% of our GDP on defense, uh, we've spent trillions of dollars in the last 10 years to prevent more terrorist acts, and I'm all for preventing terrorist acts, but when we get to the point where we can't stop climate change, people are going to be beyond angry. They're going to be livid, like, you know, you didn't tell us that we could shift those monies to investing in renewable energy, it was like solar and wind, and, and we'd be okay for another 
who knows how long, another uh, few centuries or thousands of years, um, people are going to be angry. So I just continue to hope that Obama at some point will find the strength to go directly to the American people as he did last night on jobs and explain that climate change is real and serious and needs to be urgently dealt with. I don't actually enjoy being a climate activist. I'm normal in many ways. I would like to be out enjoying a beautiful day or reading or um, you know, doing other things like most people would. I'm doing this because, as I explained before, I have a certain amount of compassion for people and it's not just my family. I, I can't bear the thought of a society like ours having the capability to fix a giant problem and not doing anything with the result that millions of people will be suffering. It's just not right. Um, so we're going to continue to do more and I, I do want to get into an idea we have that I think has the potential to do more and again there's some frustration here because you know I'm sort of in the climate movement but human nature is a funny thing. Human nature can actually explain a lot of what's going on in my view and I, I'm not a professional psychologist or whatever but when I ask myself why is it more happening I I come back to it being human nature and you have to be forgiving. You know, we didn't evolve in a way that we're attuned to really slow, mostly invisible problems. We evolved to react to enemies in your face with weapons and that's not climate change. Climate change is the stealthy problem. You need advanced understanding and equipment to really see it well. But that's no excuse for the government not to act. I mean, we've developed radar and spy satellites that the government can use to protect citizens from enemies. So uh, again, it's a role of the government, which has, by the way, spent roughly $20 billion over the past couple of decades researching climate change. and. The information is there on a government website. If you go to globalchange.gov, you can find the results. Uh, unfortunately, there's so much information there that it, it's like information overload, but information has been summarized in booklets that are available from the government. And you, you look at the booklet, and I, I have them right here, and you've got a dozen government offices and agencies that have put their stamp on the booklet, which is giving this information and it includes the office of the president, you know, the White House, the, the Department of State, the military, they're all there, the, the National Academy of Sciences, which Lincoln started a long time ago to help inform Congress about science, um, is supporting all this. I mean, the information's there, so again, it gets back to human nature. We expect to see the problem. Um, we, act, we react to problems that are visibly urgent. Um, we need help from people smarter than the average citizen to solve this. And um, <laughs> So human nature also gets to this next point. Here we are in the climate movement and I don't pretend to be um, you know, the world's greatest thinker, but I've thought about this a lot and it seems that when you come up with an idea, because of human nature, there's the so-called non-invented here syndrome. So that um, you've got other groups working on climate change and they've got the best and the brightest working on the team. So, and they're getting money from foundations oftentimes and, and they're writing up uh, their proposals. So when a, a new idea comes along, um, it's not always quickly embraced. And, um, so it can be frustrating with a new idea, and, and therefore I'm going to tell you about it, and we're trying to get the word out about this idea. And it basically involves, um, instead of civil disobedience, like we participated in at the White House and getting arrested, which is no fun, and, and 
you know, traveling down there, we felt guilty about the carbon footprint, and actually somebody rode by on a bike there and said, how, how did you get to Washington? And, you know, we grew up in a society where it runs on fossil fuels, so it's not fair to criticize somebody because they use fossil fuels to get to Washington. In fact, we were going to take the train down to save energy, but the train tracks were underwater from Hurricane Irene, which is sort of a positive feedback effect here. We, we had a drive down because the enhanced weather from climate change was preventing us from taking the, the train in a funny irony. But um, our suggestion is to try civil obedience. Well, what would that mean? Um, if you're out on the highway, uh, like 128 goes around Boston or Interstate 95, it's called now, the speed limit is 55 on many parts of it, and, and the national speed limit on many highways is 65. Well, we noticed just on the trip to Washington that coming back, um, it wasn't the first time I noticed this, but just the most recent example, that I was going over the speed limit. I'm not going to, I'll take the Fifth Amendment here and not incriminate myself, but I was going over the speed limit by a certain amount that was significant, and cars were going by me as if I were going below the speed limit. So people are speeding every day. And last time I uh, looked, so to speak, that's breaking the law. It's a minor infraction, but it seems like the, the police aren't even enforcing it that much anymore. So what if people just went the speed limit? Um, first of all, we worry about the wrong thing. People forget that 40,000 people, or, or they don't know, that roughly 40,000 people a year die in traffic accidents in the United States alone, let alone worldwide, and, and this concept could be applied worldwide. About a quarter of those accidents are attributed to speed, so slowing down could save, right off the bat, in theory, roughly 10,000 lives per year. Um, that's several times the number of people that died, unfortunately, in the World Trade Centers with the terrorist attack, which we're now uh, memorializing, and, and rightly so. But we're ignoring the highway deaths. Slowing down would also save fuel. According to EPA statistics, every um, 10 or 20 miles an hour, you reduce your speed limit by saves, uh, I think, um, I don't remember the exact number, um, but I, I think I've got it here. Um, roughly 14% of the fuel. So we could reduce, if you do a quick calculation nationally, uh, our expenditures on gasoline by billions of dollars by slowing down, and we'd save lives. Um, third, people would notice if certain citizens were going slower, um, and this gets to an important point that uh, we would need to encourage people to go slower and maybe even collaborate to go slower so that um, they'd be noticed. And this in, if done in a coordinated way, could serve as what I would call a wake-up call to citizens. Just as 9-11 is being framed as a wake-up call to America about the threat of terrorism, and, and, and we've done much to prevent terrorism, uh, going the limit, which is what we're calling the program, and, and there's a website at gotolimit.org, um, could be done in a way with the number of people that got arrested in Washington uh, around the country in a coordinated way on a Saturday, let's say, so people wouldn't be delayed going to work. Um, they could basically wake up the rest of Americans with the right message that we concerned citizens want you to wake up because of this problem that you're going to want to know about when it's obvious and when it's going to be too late. So let's encourage the president with a Go the Limit campaign to, to put a little leverage on him to make this speech to people about climate change being real and serious and urgent. And then we can work together to solve the problem and 